Welcome to The Better Podcast. I am so excited about this conversation today because we're doing it. We're going to change this up a little bit. Today, we have my partner, Giovanni, and then two of our very close friends. We have Alex and Katie Sharfin. Welcome today, guys. Thanks for having us here, Stephanie. We're excited to be on the podcast. For sure. Yeah. And I'm finding with this podcast, one of the things I am discovering is this is a medium for me to download wisdom from people that I you know, love, admire, and respect. And you guys are certainly in that category, but it's also means for me to get, you know, some of my friends on and to be like, look how awesome my friends are. Look at how awesome they are. Look what they thought of. So I'm hoping that that's going to, I know, I know that that's going to be today. And um, he's like, man, I hope that happens. So that do not let me down. <laughs> and I think, you know, when, when we, you know, you guys run a coaching business, you run Sharfin and this is a coaching company and a, you know, a strategic uh, coaching company where you're teaching people how to build teams and how to grow, you know, how to grow and scale and leverage your business. But what I thought we could do today, and we had a conversation around this, is talking about relationships. And I wanted to really download some of your framework, some of your tactics, and even just discussing some of the experiences that you've had as a couple so that we can all benefit from it. So that would you good be with awesome. that? Cool. Can, yeah. Can we preface it with something though, Stephanie? hundred percent. I think one of the things that I think Katie would agree with is that we never in a million years would have thought that we would be like advising people on their relationships. And, you know, we, we don't consider ourselves relationship experts because I feel like every marriage is work. Our marriage has been work. So I want to put that out there up front that we have been, you know, doing a tremendous amount of work on our marriage since we got married. And we mm -hmm. actually started couples therapy before we got married. We were both in individual therapy and couples therapy before we got married. But, you know, I think one of the, the, the reason why we kind of feel like we have some, some authority to share marriage strategies is we've taken what we do, we've shared it with our clients, and they've come back and told us that it's absolutely life-changing. So what was the way that we solve the issues between the two of us is what we share with people and it works for them. So that's why we're here. But I want everybody to know, like we wouldn't consider either one of us to have like a history of studying relationships. And when it, you, you mentioned earlier before when we were talking that we might go into past relationships, mm -hmm. that just makes me nervous. So <laughs> <laughs> this is not a medium to like, you know, you know, throw dirt on your exes, but I think that there's, you know, whenever we come into a relationship, it, you know, whether it's your, the relationship that you have now, I mean, we come to it with preconceived filters and schemas and, and that can, that's not necessarily from the previous relationship, but that might be from what our mothers and our fathers taught us around conflict and what, our, what they taught us about what a, what a relationship is, because those are the original models that we have. And then, of course, like your past relationships also shape us in a way. So uh, I guess my, you know, my question or my thinking around that, 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 that topic was not like, let's just you know, crap all over our exes, but you know, what we learned from them yeah. and how you brought potentially those filters and those schemas to the relationship that you have now, what was the conversation like and how did you deconstruct it if it was something that's not going to be in alignment with that current relationship? That totally makes sense. Absolutely. So let's start, let's start with your origin story because, you know, when I was prepping for this call, I actually realized that I don't even know how you guys met, which I think is crazy. So can we start with how you guys met and how, how, how your relationship came to be? Sure. So, uh, 15 years ago, yeah, 16. Uh, 16 years ago, I owned a, a large consultancy um, in Florida. And uh, part of what we did was work with major retail accounts. One of the accounts we worked with was Home Shopping Network. And <clears throat> I was such a control freak that I didn't just run the company. I set up the deals and then I stepped in front of the camera and was on Home Shopping Network. So I used to, to I, I had done tons of sales there. And at the end of being on TV for 36 hours, so I'd been there for a day and a half doing a Today special. I got off at about 10 o'clock at night or nine o'clock at night. And we went to a place called Bahama Breeze in Largo, Florida and <clears throat> ran into Katie. Katie was sitting at the bar eating and the guy who I was with and I were at the bar eating and she was one seat away from us with a guy in between. And that's how we met. Oh, wow. wow. That's amazing. I was at the time a flight attendant for Southwest and they had just set me up to be where I needed to be the next day because I was on call and there the hotel we were staying in was like some condo conversion hotel and there wasn't a restaurant in the hotel. So I just walked across the street to this restaurant and that's where we met. Neither one of us lived in Tampa. Alex lived in Fort Lauderdale. I lived in Dallas. So it really was like these 
it was like a chance meeting because we were only there for like this specific amount of time and for mm -hmm. a couple of hours. Yeah. And so we, <clears throat> what had happened prior to that, to us meeting was, um, I had been in a series of incredibly challenging relationships. Like when you say what you learned from past relationships, I learned what I didn't want and what I, what I, what I shouldn't be doing, but I didn't really have any clue what I wanted. And so um, <clears throat> about a year, a little over a year before I met Katie, I, I was seeing a therapist and he said, we were talking about relationships and I was sharing with him just how challenging things had been for me. And he pointed out that I had never been clear on what I wanted. And so he had me go through an exercise and list out 10 things that I wanted in a person that I was going to be in a relationship with. And he was really like strict with me. I, the first thing I wrote down was attractive. And he's like, why would you write down attractive? If they're not attractive, you're not going to like, you wouldn't be interested in them. Let's get the things that you don't see that you don't realize. Let's get the intangibles. And so I made this list and that night, not right when we met, but it was actually kind of funny. There was a guy sitting in between us and he was hitting on Katie and we were watching him and it was really, it was awesome. He was using like every bad pickup line in the book, like, it, it was but, embarrassing. but, but straight up, like ma trying to make him work. And Katie was shutting him down in a way that we were like, we were right behind him dying laughing. And the way that she was interacting with this guy was like super sexy. It was hilarious how she was just like kind of batting him away. And then he got dragged out of there. So there was a space in between us. We started talking. And I think we talked for about, um, I don't know, so like over two hours. The person that I was with ended up just focusing on drinking and talking to somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> and he was totally ignored. And, uh, and Katie and I talked for a couple hours. And um, I walked her outside and got her phone number. And her number ended in like 6,800. So I thought she was giving me like Domino's pizza. So I tested it while she was standing there to make sure I had it. And, uh, <laughs> I was giving him a number. <laughs> and then Tried she left. True tactic. And, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, don't think it hadn't happened to me. So, uh, <laughs> so, um, that's not true. I don't think it ever happened to me, but I felt like it was going, something was going to happen. Cause here's what happened by the end of our conversation. I had like kind of run through those 10 things in my head. Mm. I'm like, holy crap, this is the first time in since I made this list that any woman has come close to checking the boxes. And she doesn't just check the boxes, she's like crushing them. And the whole conversation, it felt like that stronger and stronger. So after I walked Katie out, she walked back to her hotel. I, in the way into the restaurant, I called my mom and said, hey, mom, I think I met the girl I'm going to marry tonight. Whoa, you called mom. I called mom. Wow. Yeah. And the next morning, my mom called me and she's like, what? what was the message that I got from you last night? And so I explained it to her. Then things got awkward because I called Katie and she waited two weeks to call me back. So my mom's calling like every, you know, 11 hours. Going, <laughs> so, hey, have you heard that? No, mom, no, nothing. I'm just getting blown off completely. Yeah, it's super false alarm. And then she finally called back after two weeks. Amazing. Isn't that yeah, ironic, that was, though? Was <laughs> what was that? Isn't it ironic, Steph, that he made a list? Yeah, I mean, I was thinking that that's exactly what you did. So uh, in a different context, uh, I was working with um, a coach uh, uh, for myself, and one of the exercises was make a list of all of the characteristics, personality traits, and attributes that I love about myself. So I made this list, and then um, I referenced it months later, and I thought, oh my God, this is the person I also want to be with. Because it wasn't describing physical characteristics. It was like yeah. the things that I love about myself. And I just had this, like 50 things. And I can send it, send it to you guys later. Uh, 50 things that I loved about myself. And then I, it became my, my sort of things to look out for. And then Stephanie, again, like you mentioned, not only checked off every single one of these things, but crushed every one of these yeah. things. And it was it became so easy to spot once you had the clarity of, of what that thing was. Well, and, and here's the other thing that it did for me, Gio. Like, so we train this now. If you go through our Momentum Masterclass, <clears throat> every, every person who's in our coaching goes through an exercise where, they're, or if they go through that part, they go through an exercise where they create a list of 10 for what it is they, they want out of their self, their business, their relationships. Um, <clears throat> and, but we take them, we actually have a preamble to that now I took what the, what the psychiatrist I worked with had given me, combined it with some frameworks we use for getting clarity from people and now use the, the list of 10 as the outcome. But here's, here's why it's so game changing when you do this. I had that list in my wallet for almost a year. 
And I talked to dozens of women in that time. And like none of them, none of them triggered any type of a thought process at all. A couple of them, I was like, oh man, you know, close, like could have been, but big, big, you know, game, game, era, big, like, um, yeah, like not red flags, but non-negotiables. Like they checked one of the absolute other side of the box, you know? Mm -hmm. And then with Katie, she checked all the boxes so strongly that since that day, when there's been a challenge in our relationship, when there's, cause like every marriage, there's not a marriage in history that hasn't been ready to end unless like they died the day after they got married or something. Cause that's about how long it takes before you, like you, you start having some type of friction in a marriage. But since that day of knowing that like, this was the only person that checked those boxes, there's a much higher commitment level to like, I made the right decision. Right. Right. And I, and I love that you're saying that because I think that, there is a fantasy or this, you know, propagated, uh, you know, it, it's just daydreaming that any type of relationship or the right relationship is just going to be a walk in the park and there's going to be no friction and there's going to be no fighting and there's going to be no disagreements when the reality is um, every single relationship, there's challenges. There's, we all come to relationships. I, mean, I was just, you know, kind of touching on this earlier. We all come with these preconceived notions, these schemas, these beliefs, these filters, whether it's from our own past trauma, trauma that we've writ- witnessed, uh, things that people have told us to be wary of. So, and I love that you guys talk about this in the context of relationships. So let's, let's kind of put a couple definitions out and I would love to download this from, uh, maybe, we, maybe we can start with you, Katie, in terms of how you define what alignment is. So obviously, t- you know, ticking off the 10 things, you know, is going to be important. How you define alignment in your relationship and was there ever a conversation, or whether it, you know, or, or a series of conversations thereof where you, do- you guys decided what your, or you identified your core beliefs as individuals and your core beliefs and values as a couple? Yeah, I think that that's one of the things that, that attracts Alex and I to each other is that we really are aligned around most major things in our lives. Um, you know, we've, we've always been strongly aligned around, you know, parenting and finances because we purposely talked about those things. Like if you look at the top reasons people get divorced and then make sure you're aligned around those areas in your life, I think that the friction points or the major sticking points in, in most relationships would, would not exist. Right. So like say, I'll just use finances as an example. Alex and I sit down every single month. We are at the beginning of the year, we're like, okay, we're chasing a net worth goal. And for some people, it may be a debt payoff goal or, you know, an outcome that they're, that they're trying to achieve. And, you know, we've, we've been debt free for a series of years. So now it's like, we're, we're chasing our net worth, but we align around that every single year and say, this is the outcome that we're chasing. And so we don't have like spending disagreements or anything like that because we're really aligned around the outcome. And so I think the mistake that most people make in, in relationships is that, like you said, it's like, we just expect them to be like unicorns and rainbows Mm -hmm. and that's not reality. And so the, the major areas in, in our life, like parenting or, or finances or sex, you know, making sure that we're really aligned around those is critically important. And it's something that we're, we're very intentional about. Like we sit down and, and meet every month. So Stephanie, the, <clears throat> in my experience of, of being in relationships, both in business and in, in a marriage, and even with kids, is that the the pri- the primary problem like there's other issues there's outside issues that that attack relationships but the primary issue in every relationship is uncommunicated expectations that create predetermined resentments and when you look at most relationships they never have the conversation about finance they never have the conversation about schedule they never have the alignment conversation and so instead what they do is they play through childhood patterns for months and years of let's fight about money, let's have conflict about time, let's have conflict about mornings, let's have conflict about getting the kids to school because that's what they were trained in, that's the energy they grew up in, mm-hmm. and that's what you expect. And so, so when, you, when you flip things around, and we've, you know, we've had a lot of the couples that come in, we, you know, we work with, with a bunch of different businesses, but a very big percentage of the population we work with is couples. And a lot of the couples that, that have come in that are running businesses together are close to divorce. And, you know, there's all kinds of information out there for relationships, but I think what Katie says is to me, 
probably the most meaningful. She makes a joke that process in a marriage isn't sexy, but you end up having a lot more sex. Mm -hmm. and, and here's why. So check it out. Number one challenge in most marriages is communication. So we have a schedule around it. You can't miss, right? We have a schedule where we work on the marriage because working on the marriage is not living in the marriage. You have to separate those two. Mm -hmm. And so we have a schedule where we work on the marriage. So we eliminate communication difficulty. We have a schedule where we talk about money. We eliminate the finance difficulty. We have a schedule where we talk about calendars and time. So we don't put pressure on each other. That's going to make us frustrated with each other. And as a result, you got married for a reason. So if there's not a lot of challenges there, you're going to have a lot of sex. And so you really eliminate the issues in a relationship and it makes it easier to overcome the outside forces that attack you. That's amazing. And I would agree with that. I think the communication and money are probably like one and two, if not tied for the reason why relationships, any type of relationship disintegrates. You can make, they make that, you know, make that comment about business relationships as well. Communication and finances, really being clear about those things. Um, are, can, I, are, can I share one other thing, Stephanie? Yeah. You said something earlier that, that Katie and I talk to people a lot is that when you said relationships, you know, that we have this fantasy that they should be easy that the right relationship should be easy. Um, I, here's what I share with entrepreneurs. The right relationship is, is difficult. The right relationship actually creates massive friction because here's what relationships are all about for entrepreneurs. I don't know about the rest of the world because I have not observed this with other people, but I've worked with entrepreneurs for two decades, thousands of them, and here's what I can tell you definitively. If we are in our right minds and we, ha we've, we marry somebody that we, we want to, we're attracted to, and we get into a relationship with, that person is actually a reflection of all of the things that we should be working on and all of the things that we need to confront and all of the things we should understand about ourselves. And so when, when you're in a conversation with your partner and you're triggered and reactive, you're triggered and reactive because of your stuff, not their stuff. And so it's difficult. And so the right relationship is going to be difficult because it's going to forge you into an entirely new person with a new perspective on the world, giving up a lot of childhood behaviors and habits, losing a lot, getting, getting out of a lot of the trauma patterns that you're in and stepping into who you should become. And I think that it's the very friction in a relationship that allows us to become who we should and allows us to create the relationship we want. So on that note, what is your process for protecting your partner when they're triggered? So, so imagine one of you gets, something happens and, and you know, all of a sudden, you, let's say Al, you're triggered and um, Katie recognizes it. What, what, how does Katie protect you while you're in that place to help you with your own growth without stepping in, without um, taking over, but uh, because that, this is the thing that we love to talk about. It's, it's, we call, I call it the bubble, like we protecting the bubble so that we know. And even I like, like I'll say now, Steph, I'm triggered. Something's going on. Um, I need to figure out where this is coming from. And I'm curious how you handle those scenarios, because what happens if you don't, if you're not conscious of it, and this is what I see in other people, both people get into this ego defense place and you're both triggered and then it turns into a fight and you, you don't even remember why you got there, but it's, it's like this mirror thing back and forth, uh, of, right. And, and you get into a fight and anger and all these negative charged emotions. So I'm curious, uh, and obviously it's not a perfect scenario or system, but what do you guys do? This used to be a huge challenge for Alex and I, and we've worked a lot on it in therapy and in other modalities <laughs> that we've used in order to you whatever know, create, we could find yeah, to create greater alignment <laughs> because we're both like we're both alike in, in a lot of ways. I mean, any personality profile that we've ever taken comes back with just a few degrees of separation. Um, which creates a, a lot of alignment between us in our marriage, but it creates a tremendous amount of challenge because we're both like fiery and we're both, you know, type A hard driving personalities. And um, so sometimes that, that doesn't mix well, especially when one of us is triggered. And so, you know, what we've learned is that we, you almost have to instinctively do the opposite of what would be natural yeah. for you. You know, so like before, if Alex would, was triggered, I would feel defensive. And so then I was triggered and then I would like feel like I needed to defend myself. And so now if I'm feeling that, I'm like, okay, the most important thing is to preserve the relationship because I have a tremendous amount of love for my husband and 
right now he's triggered with this interaction. And so now it's like slowing things down instead of speeding things up and breathing and making sure that I'm in my body and then saying like, Hey, Alex, like this is getting reactive and we've been here before. And we both know that if we continue down this path, it's not going to be for the better of the relationship. You know, we're not, it's not going to be respectful. We're not going to treat each other the way that we want to treat each other in this moment. So like, let's walk away. And so we'll take some space. One of us will go on a walk, you know, and, and we'll come back maybe a couple of hours later. And then we can actually talk through the conversation after we've thought through actually what was triggering in the first place. Because usually when you're in that reactive state, like, like you said, Gio, like you have no idea actually what caused it or what's happening unless you give your space, yourself space to go and reflect on it. Yeah. I think for anyone listening, like, um, Here's a pattern that I identified in our relationship that I also have now subs subsequently identified in the relationship of every friend I have who's married, who's an entrepreneur, mm -hmm. and every entrepreneur that we coach. And the pattern is that um, we all have trauma, 100% of us have trauma. Some, some of us recognize and understand it more than others, but 100% of us have trauma, and trauma creates triggers and reactivity. And so you can be going through a conversation, everything's fine, and then somebody says something that triggers your specific reactivity in a certain way, and then what happens is you're triggered. So here's what would be happening. Katie and I would have a be having a conversation. She would say something to me, and then I would become triggered. I would be reactive and irritated, and then here's what happens. The conversation gets left behind, and there's this whole new entity created, which is this triggered interaction where now you, like, if things go wrong, you say all kinds of crap that doesn't even have anything to do with the original conversation. And you're bringing in history and, you know, ancestry and life <laughs> and all kinds of other crap and like flooding the person completely. And then what happens and what we went to therapy for for years in the beginning of our marriage was all of the content of the triggered conversation, which was BS anyway. Right. Like the triggered content doesn't mean anything. Like once somebody is triggered, they, there's, you know, I, like whatever they say, Whatever they say is a childhood reaction to a present trigger. And right. so you're talking to a four-year-old or a seven-year-old or a nine-year-old. And then like in our case, we were actually going to therapy and talking about the nine-year-old conversation. And so right. if you're in a relationship, the faster you give up the nine-year-old conversation and repair, the faster you can get back to the conversation you were originally having when the trigger happened. And I think, you know, here's what I know. Psychologists do not get this. Because if they did, we wouldn't have been having a conversation about the triggered content for years with the therapist that we saw. And it wasn't just that one. It was therapist after therapist. You know, I've, now I've had this conversation with friends and with clients and I say, hey, there's this thing that happens and then there's this new entity created called the triggered conversation. And when I say that, they all go, oh, holy crap, dude. Like no one's ever explained it like that. Like you're right. We start talking about crazy stuff when it gets up here. Right. She starts saying things about my mom and I start saying things about, you know, when we got together and one time I even called her overweight and I was like, holy shit, I don't even know where that came from. And like that triggered conversation, you have no filter. You're, you're like, whatever age you have regressed to, that right. is the age that's actually communicating. That's why when Katie said like, we have to separate, it's because it's the same as separating children. We, yeah, I, we, I love what you're saying there because I think, you know, we have more, at least in the conversations that I'm having, more and more psychologists are really identifying this inner child or this, you know, the self-actualized adult version of yourself and sort of the baby or, or the, you know, the regressed, like I call, you know, my inner child is baby Steffi. So yeah. when, you know, so baby Steffi feels scared. She feels like she's going to be abandoned. She feels, you know, so those are her triggers. And it's interesting when you start listening or you start listening to the thoughts that start to race in your head. You're like, oh yeah, that's not me anymore. That's, that's the little, that's baby Steffi now. Baby Steffi's running the show. And even just, you know, when Giovanni and I have been in some of these scenarios where, you know, using me as an example, you know, being triggered, he will say things like, you talk differently you know, your voice, voice changes, my oh, yeah. eye movements will change, Same. my body language Same. changes, like everything starts to shift into this, you know, uh, former version of myself. And those tactics, you know, like the, you know, the, the anger and the aggression and the, 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 the triggered response for me used to serve me, right? Like they, it used to be very productive for me when I was eight. 
<laughs> right? They, it, they were. There was a, a method of self-defense, but now they're they're very destructive, and there's no there's no productivity that comes out of it. So uh, actually, it's funny we we're using uh, eight. I actually think uh, Dr. Shafali was on the podcast, and she said we're all literally eight year olds walking around in adult bodies. Yep. Um, and know. every once in a while we, we reach through to adult consciousness, but most of the time we're eight years old. We're kind of sitting in our limbic system. <laughs> and uh, it's interesting. Also, yes. Sorry, Katie, go ahead. And I wanted to add, cause we're talking about the inner child. And I think that a lot of times in couples, people don't take responsibility for their inner child and they want their, their partner to recognize it and they want their partner to love their inner child and to, and to provide what they need. Mm. And it's really important to take ownership of that for yourself. You know, I, what we've learned is that like in creating that separation, you can go and you can like recognize the behaviors in yourself and then meet your own need and not have that expectation from your partner. Yeah. One of the things we've learned is the idea of being almost being the parent that you're, inner child needs. Yeah, exactly. But that you we, never all, had. Yeah, that you never had. But we look yeah. at our partner to be that, that, to play that role, especially if it's the opposite sex. Like if, if yeah. for me, if it was my mom that I needed, or for Stephanie, if it's her dad that she needed. Uh, and almost, and then the resentment happens. And this is where I, I find all the fascination. It's like getting angry, uh, using the, the your partner as a surrogate for the anger you have towards the parent. And it's like, yeah. Mm -hmm. didn't do anything what's happening right now and and it's it's stemming from old stuff yeah um, and i happened for us a lot a lot yeah. oh man like Mostly katie for me <laughs> yeah there, a lot there was there was specific triggers so um you know katie grew up with a with a, a step parent that was super controlling and really he's incredibly difficult to be around one of the most difficult to be around people i've ever been around and uh, maybe the most just because of the situation for me personally i don't think other people feel that way but everybody thinks he's difficult and so there was a natural defensiveness to how katie answered any question like literally any question when we were younger i would say like hey did you buy milk today and she would say like i didn't have time i was on my way home to get and i had to get gas and i'd be like oh my god what about but just the milk i was just like you know we didn't drink milk, so it wouldn't have been what I said, but there was this, there <laughs> was the almond milk. Yeah. And there was this like, milk. <laughs> there was this, there was this massive reactivity to, to being questioned when she wasn't ready for a question. And it's just, she grew up in a place where like, once you got asked a question, you had to be defensive. And my natural response to that was to like, why are you yelling at me and yell back? And so that was, you know, when early in our marriage, there was a lot of things that set up conflict, but that was one that it took us forever to identify. And so, you know, like I said, it, it, and when I finally identified it, here's, here's the breakthrough that I made for myself was like, wow. So when Katie reacts like that, it's just like when I react over here. And it's just like when I get out of my body and do, and like, I, she said this, which is crazy. But over here, I said stuff that was 10 times crazier. And it, it was like, when I say that it shouldn't be easy, it was in recognizing that I had to be able to like withstand the defensiveness because that was a pattern that was set up long ago and it wasn't about me. Right. But that also there was other places where I wasn't allowing that same grace. And so again, that's how you grow through a relationship. When you guys work with entrepreneurs, so we're talking about, you know, abuse and we're talking about trauma. And of course you can parse this with your own experience, but it has been my experience because I, I get to work with, you know, the people that I work, you know, I work on with physiology and I work with, op, you know, you know, optimal human performance, but I tend to work with entrepreneurs. And what I have noticed is, and maybe you guys can come on, comment on this because of your relationship with your clients. I find that entrepreneurs in particular tend to get into abusive relationships because of our very nature. Like we are very much people who um, want to see the best in people. We are optimists. You know, we, I think we tolerate more, you know, and we want to always have that forward momentum. You know, I know that's a really big word for you, Alex. And I, you know, I, I, I bring that up because, uh, it jo you know, it's sort of jokingly, Giovanni knows that when I've had a good day, so I've d done all the things that are going to put me in physical momentum. So I've worked out, I've eaten right, I've done my meditation, and then I've had I've kicked ass that day. Like we have the best sex. We and <laughs> he knows it. He knows it because he's like, oh, okay, she's been productive today. Like we're going to have a good time tonight because that for me is almost like going out 
getting a kill and bringing you back to the tribe. Like that's how much that word, like I need to be in momentum. And I think for entrepreneurs, we, we crave momentum so much. We want that forward motion. So we, we're willing to overlook things that, you know, might not necessarily be, help. we will tolerate so much. And you teach about this in terms of your coaching in ter- from a business perspective. I wondered if you can comment on, if you've noticed that too, or that's just my own. I have a theory around the genetics of entrepreneurs. I think we actually have a different genetic makeup and I'm seeing that more and more with the clients that I, you know, Question. I might publish Question. something like that. But what, what is your observation in terms of behavior and how we, it's almost like not we attract abusive relationships, but we just, it's like we've all been in them. That's, that's sort of my observation with the entrepreneurial community that we're in. And- for yeah. play for me is at 7 a.m. saying, Steph, it's time to work out. <laughs> <laughs> like, Let me make sure yeah. for you. <laughs> Here are your supplements right next to your... Oh, your I do that. He does. He brings you my do. supplements and I'm like, oh, you want some tonight. That's what you did. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you have to set things up for success, I, you know. Yeah. Better coffee to butter you up. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> um, so Stephanie, you know what? In my experience, yeah, I think entrepreneurs, um, I don't know what the rest of the population is like, but dang, do a high percentage of us either get into and stay in or experience abusive relationships on the way to the relationship that, that we actually want to be in. Mm. Um, and I, I have so many different theories, but here's what I think it really is. Near every entrepreneur that I've ever been around experienced radical, massive discomfort in some area of their lives when they were younger. And for some of us, that massive radical discomfort, like for Katie, that was in, in the house and at home, like going home was very scary for Katie. For me, going to school was like, it was such crazy daily trauma that now, now that I understand what happened, now that I've done enough therapy that I know what happened, like I understand my behavior so much better as an adult because... I literally went through what most people would call torture for my pretty much my entire school career. If you read the definition of torture, read what, like if I shared with you the things that happened, it's that. It was like psychological daily um, torture. And so for, for, um, oh shit, I just just lost my train of thought because I had to talk about school. Um, (laughs) Oh, so all of us have, have had a really, like really uncomfortable situation and it's hard to find an entrepreneur, I don't think I have yet, that was in an uncomfortable situation who knew how to access help. We actually were in uncomfortable situations without a lifeline for a long time. And so what happens is that energy that we grew up with of being in this awkward position, feeling like the outlier, not having a lifeline, not knowing a way out, it becomes familiar. And then as adults, depending on how long a time you spent there, it's highly likely you, likely you recreate that in your relationship. And I think that what we grow up with is ours to overcome. But if, but if we don't do the personal work, we will repeat the energy we grew up in. So the stress, the pressure, the noise, whether you understood what was happening or not, your body absorbed that energy mm. and you will recreate it unless you do the work to let it go. That's and good- so- that's so true, man. I, I gotta say, I felt the same way growing up as a kid, like bullied at school for, you know, people made fun of my, everything from my lips to my butt to my, you know, the way I looked, my thick eyebrows, all those kinds of things. And same thing at home. I had a, I had a, you know, relatively traumatic home life without feeling like I had a lifeline. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So I, I was the same way, Stephanie, you know, my, my, I was close with my mom. Um, but my mom had been a school teacher. And so I would, when I first started going to school, I'd come home and say like, hey, this is not good. I can't do this. This is why it's really bad. The kids are mean to me. And I would get back things like, oh, you'll, you'll figure it out. And you'll make friends and it'll get better. And you know, my mom was a very genuine, very transparent, very grounded person. But at 20 something years old, this is what she told you know, a seven or eight year old coming home from school. And so I felt completely invalidated. And like when it came to, to school, I had to now hide what was going on Otherwise, I wasn't showing up like she wanted me to show up. And so, you know, that, that, so not only did I feel like not, so, so as a result, as an adult, I was in relationships where I was consistently invalidated and in highly stressful situations. I feel like uh, we, we often talk about how, uh, I think it was Philip McKernan who said, your gift is next to your wound. So it's often people like us who suffer some kind of pain 
uh, or, or trauma. And trauma, we should probably define at some point because I think people assume trauma means you went to war or you were sexually abused and it doesn't have to be those things. Uh, it can yeah. be a lot of different things. But, but to feel pain, and if you are like us, it creates the tendency that you want to help other people avoid the same pain that you've been through. And you get into this, this sure. place of service and it, 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 it turns into entrepreneurship. You're like, I want to help. I want to be helpful. And then um, when you want to be helpful and of service, it, especially if you're super giving, it's that place where if you don't know how to create boundary, that you get into those abusive relationships. Yeah. Um, or with, right. So I think that's kind of the pattern that I've been seeing with people like us and, and the, the trauma and the pain turns into a superpower. Yeah. If Ruby said you know, your wound is where the light enters, you right. know, and, and yes. or maybe it was your wound allows the light to enter. You know, when you say that, that like your wound is right next to your superpower, I kind of see them as one and the same. I've worked with so many entrepreneurs that I'm like, where's the biggest pain? Okay, that's how we're going to solve whatever's going on in your life. And, right. you, and, and getting to it is, is like, it's not easy, but that's where things really change. What were you going to say? I was breathing. Oh, sorry. I thought you were going to say something. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I got to let Katie talk. <laughs> how, do you, how do you guys define intimacy? And I'll say, I'll frame it like, you know, an intellectual intimacy, because I know that there's going to be, like Gio and I often say, you know, we're like the consigliere, like I'm his consigliere, you know, like he talks to me about things that he might not discuss with other members of the team, um, emotional intimacy, and of course, physical intimacy. What, how, do you, how do you define those parameters for your relationship? transparency, mm-hmm. radical transparency. Mm-hmm. You know, I think um, any attempt to create intimacy with any lack of transparency will not be successful and you will constantly struggle with it. And I think the biggest issue that we see in relationships is lack of transparency. It's like that, it's that easy. People don't tell each other what's going on, how they feel, what's really happening and what they want. And that causes massive, massive lack of intimacy. And the the and here's what's great: like the bridge to getting there is just communicating more. Mm-hmm. And we tell our clients that um, the two rules for entrepreneurial success for entrepreneurial success, if you want a successful business, is that your marriage comes comes first, and that transparency in your marriage is absolute, or in your partnership. You know, if you're mm-hmm. if you're not married, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and it's very difficult. I think you know we've talked about this marriage is marriage is difficult, especially, you know, if the relationship's worth it and, um, you know, because you'll, you'll end up doing the work and, and doing a lot of personal work, which is difficult. Mm-hmm. And it's difficult to look at yourself and, and understand where your dark sides or your shadow spaces may be. And then, and bringing those into the light and working on them. Um, but we also, I don't think I got my train of thought. You were just talking about um, being in a relationship and working on your shadow spaces. Uh-huh. And I think you were to say, I don't know where you're going. I don't know what the context was before that. Sorry, <laughs> Stephanie. <laughs> we looked at each other, made eye contact, and got distracted. Sorry, Stephanie. That <laughs> <happens to> <laughs> <us>. <laughs> no, we were talking about intimacy. Oh, intimacy. We were talking about intimacy. Yeah, yeah. And then, um, and then I was saying, working on your shadow, working on your shadows, but like shining a light on your shadows. Yeah, that it was difficult to do the work individually. But that, okay, yeah. We'll pause for a second so y'all can cut that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're going to cut them at 2.49 is where we're going to cut. Yeah, come on. And I think when you're in a relationship that's worth the work, that you will you will work on those shadow spaces and and really knowing yourself. And, and if you have a partner will that, that will do that work as well, that creates a level of in- intimacy and trust. Um, that that a lot of relationships actually lack because if you're not transparent with your partner, there's like Alex said before, there's there's expectations and misalignments that are unspoken. And so, you know, your partner can't meet an expectation that that they don't understand and that you haven't brought forth and and out into the open. Um, so I think, you know, really communicating and aligning and being willing to work on yourself personally creates a deeper, deeper in- intimacy in your relationship and in your marriage. Um, here's what's interesting too, you know, when we were younger, um, when we first got together, uh, we had this thing, like we were going to therapy together, like we were going to fix this together and we were going to both have to be in the room and it was really terrible. And so we were both going to like get through it. And there was a point where, um, 
I actually had some other stuff going and I had to go, I went and started doing EMDR therapy separate from Katie. And I had done EMDR therapy before a lot. Like that's part of the way I had learned how to find Katie. And um, here's what's interesting. When I was younger, people used to say the thing like, hey, if one person in a relationship goes and does work, the relationship will improve. And I totally thought that was BS. I'm like, how could that possibly happen? And what I've noticed in our marriage and in the marriages that I coach or the marriages where we work or the businesses where we work with people who are married is that that absolutely happens. Because here's, the, here's the, the foundational issue in most relationships and especially most marriages is that there is a pattern of conflict that has yet to be undus, undone, discovered, and then broken apart. And so it's whatever that pattern of conflict is in your marriage. But if you find yourself fighting about the same thing over and over again, there it is. Mm -hmm. And so it's not until you can identify that pattern or shift that pattern of conflict that the marriage improves. So here's what, what, what's interesting for anybody listening. Like you don't both have to be working on it. There's been times in our marriage where we've worked on it together. There's been times where I've been going to therapy and Katie's not. There's been times when Katie's going to therapy and I'm not. There's been times where one of us is doing something else and, and the other one's doing something else. But in the times where one of us is getting help somewhere, the marriage improves because we're breaking the relationship patterns that are damaging by, uh, by stepping out of ourselves and understanding more about the relationship. So if you're in a relationship and you go work on yourself, it's going to improve not only that relationship, but all of them. Well, I think that's, you know, if I were to expand on that, I would say that in any relationship, there's three moving parts. There's the two individuals and then there's the relationship. Yeah. So I completely agree with that idea that individual work is going to, uh, you know, synergistic, synergistically improve the relationship because the relationship is its own entity, as are the two individuals that make it up. So I, I love what you're saying there. Um, I have a question. Uh, I wanted to expand on what you just said, Alex, but I wanted to kind of direct this to Katie. You said, you know, knowing yourself is really important. And as a woman, what I have found, and I can't speak for all women, but I can say personally, it has been an ongoing uh, journey of self-discovery and an opportunity to lean in in order for me to learn what it is that I want. So learning how to ask for what I want has been probably, and maybe that comes from my upbringing where if you asked for something or you were vocal, it was like shut down right away. So mm -hmm. I have learned that, you know, the quieter you are, the less likely you are to get, you know, whatever consequence. Um, have you found that to be true in terms of having as a woman being, because I think there's this narrative around the woman should be able to do everything. We have, we look, we're always looking, we always look hot. We always, you know, we always look perfect and put together, but then we also have all the laundry done. The kids are bathed and clean. The house, there's a home cooked meal. Um, and I think that there's a, a tremendous around, amount of guilt when you uh, can't get all those things done because we have this sort of superwoman complex that we, I think we all internally struggle with. Mm -hmm. um, has that, do you, and has that been true for you? Is that just, is, uh, is it just me? And uh, if it is, uh, if, if that does resonate with you, what are some of the ways that you have found to overcome that? So I've had, I've had everything from people clearing my throat chakras to, you know, therapy as well. So maybe you can expand on that if that, if that resonates. It's funny how the throat chakra comes up so often in yeah, <laughs> your yeah. work with like throat and sacrum. And yeah. Like yeah, for sure. And yeah, yeah. um, I don't know if that's across the board with women or entrepreneurial women, or, or I think it's standards in society that have told us not to use our voice. And maybe that's just a social dynamic. I'm unsure. Mm -hmm. um, but I would say, yes, I definitely have struggled with this. Um, I did for like for a better part of like a decade. <laughs> and then I decided that beating myself up and not, and like feeling like I wasn't good enough and that I would never measure up and that I, you know, couldn't, you know, be a 10, you know, on the hot scale and then also have like this gourmet hot cooked meal and, you know, my house completely organized. And, and I used to just beat the crap out of myself. And now and um, I would say about five years ago, I've always had a personal help, like with the kids or had a housekeeper coming maybe once every couple of weeks. And now I've just kind of blown the lid off of that. And I hire as much personal help at home as we almost do in our business. And I run our house like an extension of our business. And it is like a separate entity that needs 
structure and support and a, and a lot of help because there's a ton of moving parts and I am on, an entrepreneur and I do want to run the, a, a business with my husband because I feel excited and it, and it gives me joy and it like keeps that part of my brain active. And um, so I just, I let go of the guilt and I started like hiring people and getting personal help and realizing that my kids and my husband don't care if I actually put the hot meal on the table or if I folded the underwear, they care that they have underwear and food. So Stephanie, right. for years, I had been telling Katie that, like I had been saying like, we have a lot of money. Like, let's get a chef and a, and a somebody to do. Because I, when I, the first five years of my life, I lived in Mexico and my parents had a lot of money and we had help. Like, I remember having, like, if I wanted an apple, I said, I want an apple and it was in my hand. So I'm like, let's just recreate the apple in the hand thing. Mm -hmm. And Katie would, would fight it like crazy. It was hard to get somebody to just come in and, and clean the house and much less like order food or do, you know, she, she had this like impression she had to do it all. And then what would happen is when she couldn't do it all, oftentimes she was mad at me because I wasn't doing anything, but I'm like, Hey, I already gave you a solution. Like <laughs> I don't yell at me about vacuuming. I already told you I would hire somebody to vacuum. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to vacuum. I never have. When you met me, I didn't vacuum. Remember? And so, you know, like that, that well, I'm not going backwards. I already got out of that stuff. And so what, what I, what we finally did was when you say treat your marriage like a business, since we made that switch, I, Katie was on sabbatical and she like brought up another thing that was frustrating. I don't remember what it was, but it had to do with time pressure. And I'm like, Katie, you just need to do a two week time study. You know, we have executives do two week time studies, do a time study right now. And she go, she's like, but I'm not working. I'm like, exactly. You're not working and you're totally overwhelmed every day. So let's do a time study. So Katie did a time study. And at the end of the first week, she's like, son of a, and yelling from upstairs. And I'm like, what? She goes, it takes me 22 hours to get food on the table every week. And I'm like, I told you. And she's like, we're, we're getting a chef. I'm going to see what else I can get rid of. And so from that point forward, that was it. Like we, now the bow broke. We hired a chef named Tara. She's trained at the French Culinary Institute in New York. She cooks food like that's crazy. And it costs us like a couple hundred dollars a week. Mm -hmm. We got, you know, 20 hours of Katie's time back with a couple hundred dollars a week. And you keep looking at like the places where we're able to do that. And now the, the, our house runs like a machine. We never are out of anything or missing anything or any of the stuff that like most people deal with frustration in the house. And if we find ourselves in a supermarket, it's either because we wanted to go or like right. a mistake happened somewhere. <laughs> I think also like, I, I want to preface this because Alex said like, we have the money and I think some people don't have the money, yeah. you know, like it, so it's, it's difficult. Like they're, they're starting their business or they're, you know, they're two incomes or whatever the circumstances are. But here's the deal in today's society, there is way too many apps. There's way too many opportunities. There way, there's way too many things that don't cost a lot of money or save you money or they actually save you money where you can create efficiencies in your life. Yeah. And so, you know, I used to borrow on those quite a bit and now I've just like ramped it up as, as far as I can in order to create space and, and time, um, a, around me and our family. And really Alex said like, you got the time back, but what I also got was I'm not resentful anymore. I don't have that expectation on myself. I don't feel like I'm failing every single day. I can be really present with my husband and really present with my kids and get like quality time that that's what I really want. You know, I want my children and my husband to know me and not know the, you know, irritated and resentful me who's like making a meal at the end of the day when I already feel like I have two full-time jobs. Yeah. And what Katie said, super, like, it's so true it, to, in these days. So we work with people who come in and they don't have a lot of money and they're in a couple hundred thousand dollar business and they're counting every single penny. But like, if you look at all the stuff you buy every month for your household and you make a list and you put it on Amazon, they'll give you a 5% discount, deliver it to you. You don't have to pay for gas. And so just doing that, and it keeps you out of the store where you're making impulse purchases. So just doing that, like there's so many little things like that, that once you set them up, you can release a lot of the responsibility that you're feeling. That's incredible. Anyone can do that. I love that. Yeah, Any, and 100 I mean, of people, everybody's buying toilet paper, like set your stuff up so that the toilet paper lands on your doorstep and it's cheaper. And so I'll just, honestly uh, say that having a chef has actually saved us money, which I know is like, totally doesn't seem like that could be possible, but we're not eating out as much. 
we, I have, there has to be a meal plan because I have to like tell her what we're actually making for the week so mm -hmm. that, you know, we understand what's showing up. I'm not in the grocery store hungry, you know, throwing things in the cart that I normally wouldn't <laughs> or, you know, that I normally wouldn't or that are, is like Alex said, an impulse buy. So, you know, having her has actually saved us money and like there's consistently food in the refrigerator. So like it, it's created so much less stress around meals. And, and you're, eating me, huge. you're eating healthier. Huge. You're eating healthier. Probably with a lot Wait. less sugar or processed crap. So now oh, you can actually so make better healthier. decisions than everything else you're doing. Exactly. Yeah, we just send everything we send Tara when we want it to be is all Whole30. And so we're eating a Whole Foods diet that's prepared by somebody who, like neither one of us can cook food anywhere near as good as Tara. And your house smells amazing. Yeah, it's awesome. She comes over <laughs> and cooks bacon and it's like the best day of the week. <laughs> and, I, and I love that. And, you know, Katie, I think, you know, kudos to you for... Uh, that takes the sick to cert that takes a certain amount of strength and courage to be able to say, you know what, I need help. Like we had, a, we just had some people over for coffee, and I had uh, one of the women I was talking to afterwards. She's like, I want to help you, you know, do such and such. And I was like, you know what, I'll pay for your time. She's like, you know what, can you just receive? Like, just I want to just help you. I just want to help you for the because it also makes me feel good. And I was totally taken aback by it because um, I, I'm. You know, I always assume that there's like things are transactional. That was just like an unconscious <laughs> thing for me. Like, oh no, she actually just wants to help me because she thinks I'm, you know, that I'm worth it or that she thinks that she can help. And it's also valuable for her in some way. So, you know, just wanted to acknowledge how difficult that is, especially for, I think, especially for women, we have this expectation where we have to do all, be all, we have to do it in five inch heels and it's, you know, it's never ending. So, um, and one of the themes from the coffee that we had today with, with these people that were over was, you know, you don't know, how did we, how did we frame it, Geo? It was, you don't know, you don't know how, how good it is. It is. Or, yeah. You don't know how bad it is until it's good. You know, like you would yeah. never probably go back now and say, I, I think I'm going to go back to cooking everything myself. Not a right? chance. Yeah. Mm -mm, not a chance. Cause I have perspective. I also have perspective now that she comes every week, just how pissed off I was. <laughs> You know, yeah. and so like, I don't ever want to go back to feeling like that because that's torture. That's mm -hmm. torture for me. And it, then I'm showing up in a way with my family that doesn't, it's, it's not something I want to model. That's for certain. We have a, a housekeeper. And I remember when we first did a time study with you guys, my, my, my thing was what the hell I'm spending 10 hours a week on laundry or whatever, or <laughs> filling the dishwasher or, or some random, I was like, what the hell? And, and it, it also took time away from our kids. Yeah. Right? Because oh, yeah. They're here and we're here. We're all in the same house, but we're not being present. Yeah. And our decision was, do we, do we get a nanny? Or do we get a housekeeper? And I, I, I think we made the right decision to get someone to take over all of the housekeeping, uh, uh, laundry, groceries, all that kind of stuff, because that frees up not only our time to be more present for work, which we both love doing our work, but also freeing up our time to be present for the kids. Yeah, which is interesting. And let's be honest, Gio, you and I suck at housework. Yeah. Oh, me Most and entrepreneurs are terrible up. at it. All yeah. of us are. I mean, yeah. as entrepreneurs, we're, we're not detail people. We're not in the moment people. Like housework is a, you need to be present. Like most entrepreneurs I know go to clean a room and they end up like reading a book, reorganizing a shelf, walking out, going on a walk, coming back, listening to a podcast and going, what was I doing? <laughs> you know, like we're not, we, we, we don't have that, that, that skill set is lost on us. So why try? hundred percent. Yeah, I agree. And, and we're just, yeah. And we're just not executors. Like we're just, like you were saying, like we're sort of visionaries thinking about the future or loss, you know, Gio's head is always like in the future, thinking about what we're doing in the future. There was this day, Stephanie, where I, I was, I was like thinking, I thought, you know what? I just need to admit to myself that if I don't delegate it, it's not going to get done. There was this day where I was sitting with like a mile long to-do list. I think I was like 28 or 29 years old. And I remember looking at this to-do list and thinking, and going back a few days and thinking that only things have gotten checked off are things other people did. Like I'm getting nothing done here. And it's because I'm running this massive business. I have a huge team. So I actually made the switch and said, okay, all right. So this is how life's going to be for me. I have to now, if something needs to get done, my first question has to be who's going to do it. Cause I know it's not going to be me. And that's how, like, literally that's how I live my life today. A hundred percent of the time. Let's talk a little bit about your frameworks. So in your business strategy and in your coaching program, you talk about having yearly goals and then backing those into quarterly and monthly and weekly. 
Um, I'm assuming it's the same in terms of the cadence or the rhythm that you have for your relationship. Mm -hmm. Could you give us a couple of examples of maybe what a yearly, a quarterly uh, relationship goal might look like for you? And then, uh, you know, we've talked about, you know, communication and finances. So if you can maybe like pick one of those, you know, pick one of those or both of those in terms of how that plays out on the daily with both of you. And maybe we can parse this with a, with a, feeding it into how this works with your family and if there's a, a, a you know rituals and rhythms with the family sure sure um well let's start stephanie with the annual so here's what we suggest for every relationship is that you chase a net worth goal so whether you have a debt reduction goal which is really a net worth goal or a net worth building goal that you chase one of those two because here's what you want in a relationship around the conversation of finance you want agreed to constraint like as entrepreneurs, we don't want constraint anywhere, but we have to have agreed to constraint. So an agreed to constraint is, this is a net worth goal we're chasing. So in order to make this net worth goal, we're going to have to make decisions during the year that allow us to do this. So that, that lays a foundation for the high level discussion. Otherwise you're just having a discussion about money and opinions. And so when, you know, when we're saying, hey, remember we're chasing this number, maybe we don't, you know, do the thing that we're going to do this month, or maybe we make a decision to do it later in the year. So first and foremost, alignment about the number you're chasing as a couple changes so many things because it now creates, a, it forces a conversation about here's the thing we're trying to do. This is our objective. And these are the decisions we have to make. Also, um, during, there's a couple of things around finances that so like when you're working into that annual target or that annual goal, an important thing is to like forecast and go, what are the major expenses that we're going to have in a year? So like this year, Alex and I are going to sit down next week and go over our stuff because we're going into 2020, but we're going to rehab our kitchen next year. It's a major expense. It's a major pain, you know, but it's something if we're forecasting it and we're understanding that it's happening, then we're both kind of working our way up to it and we're, and we're saving financially. So when the time comes to write the check, it's like it was anticipated. There's no, there's no like freak out over like number shock or sticker shock because we were aligned around the outcome from the beginning. Um, and then I'll also say for entrepreneurs who are working together in a business, um, and I would say even for just for entrepreneurs who are married, I think that it's critical to have an alignment around like a number that you're not going to invest in the business because sometimes business requires that you invest back into it. And so you have to have like a, a, a emergency an fund. emergency fund for you personally that is like, we will not touch this because we're not going to, per, you know, to sacrifice our personal stability for the sake of a business. And so, you know, if, if you align around a number that or a threshold that you won't go under to sacrifice your personal stability, then I think that that takes, um, it stops some it, dreaming. It stops dreaming. It stops dreaming. Entrepreneurs it, are way too optimistic when you have mm -hmm. that, that threshold. And we've, we've like, there's been times where we've had businesses that aren't making money and where we've invested. And then we will be like, Hey, here's the threshold. It's way over here, but but it's uncomfortable. But he, the reason we can tell that it's coming is we've established it. And the second it's like, oh man, we're moving towards the threshold. Well, screw that. So we stay out here most of the time. And then it also forces you to make different decisions about your business. In your because business. If, if you're investing that much money into your business, there's like this, this, this place that you'll have to stop and go, hey, it's not working and we have to make better, different decisions because our personal lives aren't worth it are like sacrificing our personal financial stability is not worth the success of a business. Yeah. We've seen too many entrepreneurs who um, have what they think is a good idea, invest their way into momentum. And, and it doesn't, it's not real momentum, but it feels like it because you're doing a bunch of stuff. There's a lot of activities going on. You're releasing the thing. You're putting out the this, you're doing this. But what you're really doing is spending a lot of money with no income plan. And being in that place as an entrepreneur, here's the problem. If if we go long enough with a bunch of activity without revenue coming in, we start to, to create false beliefs about ourselves. We start to have insecurities about ourselves. Like if we don't see the world acknowledging that we're doing something positive, we start to have serious challenges. And if you're investing into that situation, it can be a path down a very, very dark hallway. So what does the communication look like then for the two of you? Is there a daily ritual that you have, weekly check-ins with you yes. know, how you're moving towards that net worth goal or how, what does that look it, like? It's a, it's a highly structured system, Stephanie. We, we do our annual planning just like we do in our business. 
Then we do quarterly planning. We look at what are the things that we want to tackle for the quarter. Like Katie said, we're going to do our kitchen. We're going to do our staircase this next year. And so those are major expenses that we will pull into a quarter. And then we're both aware that it's going to happen. So on a quarterly basis, we're bringing in the big things. Then on a monthly basis, we're sitting down and we're looking at finances mm -hmm. and discussing and calendars and saying, what are the big things that are happening this month? We have a vacation or the kids have a play or something, or there's something else going on over here. And so what we're trying to do is eliminate what's going to cause conflict. Remember what we said was going to con uh, com communication, um, finances, and time pressure are the top three in order. Those are the top three issues in marriages. And then it's sex. And I think like one, two, three causes you not to have sex. That's why it's number four. And so if you can eliminate those in the process and so then, then weekly, we sit down and we have a weekly alignment and we share with each other. This is what we do in, in the business. We share our weekly report. So it's um, what went right, where do you need support to move forward and what are you planning for next week? And then we go through a daily alignment where we share what's in our momentum planner. And so each of us share, do you want to do the daily? Cause I've been talking. About yeah. That. Each of us starts and we start with, you know, um, where we what we were grateful for in the day at uh, the previous day and then where we won the previous day, because that like, you can celebrate with your partner. You're excited about their wins. Like you're starting the conversation with a through line of gratitude. And so that, you know, when you're, when you're it's starting actually any transaction, you're starting any like meeting or cadence or interaction that way. Like it's just a really positive lens. And it's scientifically proven to actually create a more positive outlook towards what you're doing to recognize gratitude, not just gratitude, but gratitude, and then where you felt like you specifically won or had an outcome that was important to you. So go ahead, sorry. And, and then we'll each share what our intention for the current day is, um, and then we'll do what our top three are for the day, so the top three things that we wanna get accomplished or what's important to us in the day. And then if anything from the previous day made us uncomfortable, so if there was like an uncomfortable interaction in the business, it's just so that we have an awareness to it, and I think that a lot of people will be like, oh, I don't want to share that. But what happens there is that like if Alex had a frustration yesterday that caused him to be short with me or like withdrawn or vice versa, and then we have an understanding and we don't take it personally. It's not like, oh, something's going on in the relationship. You have a greater understanding of what actually is going on for your partner. I have a communication question. With respect to how you create your structures for communication within the team, you share, you're very transparent with your leadership team. Um, so there's, there's a flow of communication with the structures. Do you share your marriage stuff with anybody else? Or is that just between the two of you? Like all, what, what you talk about on the weekly and the daily, is that just between the two of you? It's just the two of us. However, um, Reagan's 13. And now that she's 13, we're going to pull her into our family financial conversations. Um, you know, she's, she's grown up relatively affluent, but when she was a baby, we were bankrupt. So when she was like, like a year old, she, we were in tremendous financial stress and pressure. And she remembers that and actually feels financial anxiety a lot of the time. And like, there was a time where Katie was like, um, we're not going to buy that. It's too much money. And Reagan was like, oh my gosh, we're going to go bankrupt. And so, <laughs> you know, she's really, she's concerned with it, but for two reasons, um, we're going to pull her into our financial discussions. So one, she understands the overall finances of the household because most kids never understand that, even look at that. And two, we, you know, she's now a member of like old enough that we believe she wants, she can understand what's happening in our financial lives to give her peace of mind and security and understand how we make decisions. And so if she's, if she stays in our house until she's 18, she'll have five years of financial discussions around decisions being made in a household that I think, I don't, I don't know of any kids who get that type of an opportunity. So where it's appropriate, we are now bringing the kids into the conversation, but at age appropriate where there's like attention and focus ability and also um, the appropriate discussion for, for them to hear. So when Kennedy's 13, she'll join the financial discussion as well. And we homeschool our kids. So part of that is like teaching financial literacy, how we see it and, you know, really understanding how to survive in the world and what's important, not actually what's taught in school. Yeah. What you need for the real world. Our homeschooling is about dominating. <laughs>
<laughs> and I, like, I wish I had that when I was 13 to be able to speak about, you know, cause you know, and I'm totally dating myself here, but you know, through 1989, there was, you know, I remember Chris, like, I remember the discussion with my parents, like, you know, there was a huge contraction that year economically and like, well, Christmas is going to be small and we can't afford this and we can't afford that. So I too have that in my nervous system where I'm like, oh my God, we're, we're going to run out of money. And like, that would have been so valuable. I mean, for me, not just me, but like anybody, um, you know, if you're a parent that's listening to this uh, with someone who is around that age, like 13, 14, that would be a great time to start an age appropriate discussion around finances. Cause that's not even taught in school. We don't learn about, we don't learn about that in school. Yeah. Well, and Stephanie also by bringing her into those alignment meetings, she'll also see how we make decisions of like, we're going to do the staircase. We're not going to do the staircase, or we're going to do this, this month, not this month. Right. Because I think one of the big things about moving out of your parents' house for most people is you get out and you're like, Oh crap, how do you handle any of this like you have no tools whatsoever to do anything yeah. you know much like you're, you're in this new place but you really don't know how to do step one and so when when our kids transfer out of our home we want them to transfer to a place where they they know how to run the place they're moving into the same way we do and so by by giving them that up close and personal like view of it and actually allowing her to be in the conversation and influence decisions she'll she like that that's such a better um, way to train somebody than any type of curriculum. So, and, and I wanted to just share one other thing that's interesting. You know, um, I, I bought a new car this year and uh, whenever I buy a car, I just go and I write a check and I get the car and that's, it's one transaction. And then I spend a ton of money making the, the car that I think it should have, they should have made it originally. <laughs> and um it's a it's a crazy habit to like buy cars and put a whole bunch of money into them but it's it's like the one thing that i love doing in the world and so that's the biggest hobby that i have is like customizing cars and going to the track and racing them and stuff and two years ago we had in our financial alignment that i i would buy a car and i didn't and then last year i did uh last year i didn't I, it was in our financial alignment that i would buy a car and i didn't and it got to the point where Katie, like we would drive by a Lamborghini and I would go, wow, that's really nice. And she would go, well, we already have a car in the budget. Like she was at the point where just buy a car. And so it's like a reverse of what most people deal with. Like, you know, people like I, the, the guy that I, that does my cars, he says stuff like, man, your wife's so cool that she let you buy these cars. And I literally said like, Duncan, you have no idea. She was pushing me to buy this car for the last two years. And so when you have these discussions, you get a different level of support out of your marriage. Like I never feel guilty going to buy a car because usually by the time I buy it, Katie's been telling me I had to buy a car for at least a year, but it's because we have that alignment and she'll say like, Hey, you know, you haven't got a car in a while. I know this is really, really what you love to do. Like when's the next time you're going to do it. And like that discussion is there because we create the space for it. But I mean, I, I, when I listen to the conversations that, that are reflected back to me about what happens in marriages, I'm like, what a crazy contrast. Like, a guy goes out and buys a car and his wife takes his head off and they're fighting for two months. And I have my wife like literally waving a blank check at me for two years. So when you set this up right, it changes everything. And it just makes it like we all want support of our, out of our relationships. But when you add the process, you finally start getting the support you want. I also think, um, you know, we talked about the inner child, like Alex's inner child really lights up and he gets really <laughs> excited and he goes out and stares at his car. And he'll be like, I'm going to go on a drive. I'm just going to go around the block. And it puts him in a state of momentum. Yeah. And I want that. I want my husband to thrive. I want my husband to be excited. I want him to have like an energy release or some place that he can go and like go fast and you know, and be excited because it's really childlike and it's super hot when he's like, <laughs> when he's like, like that, you know, so, you know, then we, and it's also, you know, play. I love what, what I'm hearing is play, right? I'm hearing like being playful. And that's like one of our core values, right? Is being playful and not childish, but childlike, I think, yeah. you know, is, is, is incredible. This has been such a useful and like insightful conversation. Thank you guys so much for being here. Yeah, yeah, for sure, absolutely. Stephanie. It's been a lot of fun. We don't have this conversation often. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, I love everything you said, because when we think about personal relationships, you know, it's the most important part of your business. It's the most important part of, you know, your personal life is, is you know, the, uh, I've heard you say, Alex, something to the effect of you're only as strong as your weakest link, which is oftentimes for entrepreneurs, their marriage. 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, you know, spending the time to invest in your marriage and to define the parameters, Katie, like you were saying around, these are the monetary goals. These is, this is, and this is how we're going to continue to have this cadence and this rhythm uh, and this repetition of communication, uh, I think sets you up in success for success in ways that, you know, I don't think you would have ever imagined possible before doing it. So I really appreciate both of you coming on here and Giovanni, I appreciate you two coming on here and, uh, and having this discussion today. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Katie you. and Alex, if we, if we wanted to point people to you guys on the web, what would be the best place that I can uh, put this in the show notes and in the, um, and obviously in the audio as well, where can people find you? So two places. We have a podcast called the Momentum Podcast for the Entrepreneurial Personality Type. Uh, you, and Stephanie's coming out soon. So if you um, subscribe, you'll hear her soon. Uh, it, you can go to MomentumPodcast.com. And then the second um, place to go is if you'd like to learn more about what we do, how we help people grow their businesses um, and scale their teams, you can go to PredictableBusinessSystems.com. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Yeah, you got it. Thanks, Stephanie. Thank you.